I enjoyed that movie, Inglorious Bastards. But yeah, I get it if you don't like it. Hi everyone, we got a chatty, <laughs> we got a chatty crew tonight, love it, what's up, these glasses are way too reflective, um, I'm trying them out, seeing if I like Chocolate. them, blue, Chocolate. blue, Chocolate. what is it, blue, screen, filter, screening of the screen variety, uh, why can't I hear anything, come on, why can't I hear chocolate, why, I've got gift bot up, did that good? Oh, I muted because I tried to, to to mute everyone and I muted that. All right, if anyone wants to play chocolate again, go for it. No, that was me. That was me, everyone. I looked at the countdown and I was like, oh, four seconds. <laughs> we were talking about DEF CON 5 and the story kept evolving. Isaac, thank you so much. Two years. Two years we've been doing this. Oh, I just, <laughs> just ate the love heart. <laughs> it just sucked it in. The timing of that was fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for celebrating two years on streams and Twitch. Play video games. We do just chatting. I yell at you in a fake kitchen. And we do book chat, which is one of my favorite things. I have a physical copy of a book, which never happens. The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Clune. We're going to be talking about the first half of this book. As you can see, I have not cheated. What is my, <laughs> what was that meme that we put out where it's like, what's your, what your um, bookmark says about you. And it's like chaotic evil is dog marking or like ripping out the page. Um, 
I think I was like neutral, chaotic neutral, which is just like you grab an envelope or a spare bit of paper and that's all of a sudden a bookmark. That's today's. I had this other one that came in a pack and it was a golden metal leaf, but every time the book would, oh, memorizing the page is lawful evil. <laughs> Let's get that meme back in the reading chat if it's existing somewhere. Um, someone will do it. I hope, maybe, maybe. Um, I tried to use a real bookmark. It was made of metal and it kept flying out of the book every time I moved too quickly. And that was um, chaotic evil for me. Uh, but anyway, book good. We are talking about this particular book. Uh, I've got a Google Doc up. Some people, Isaac, KP Dubs, Catch 22, all making some notes, which is so great. It's like study group, but voluntary and not science. <laughs> I know that every time we talk science, I personally offend everyone because of my science ineptitude. It's just, you know, I, I realized, I thought about it actually, Catch-22, this one's for you. And it actually, Isaac goes in this one as well, slightly being more of a sciencey person and oddball and KP, most of you. Uh, I'm street smart, not book smart. And I really just had to come to terms with that. I'm street smart. I've got incredibly high social IQ and I can read the room and I can be charismatic and I understand streets. I feel like I'm defending my character because I can't name an element on the periodic table that starts with B. <laughs> Boromir. Wasn't he a character in Lord of the Rings? <laughs> Wait, is that <laughs> <laughs> It was Borium. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> that says everything. Boron. Okay, I think I got Borium and Boron mixed up. And um, instead, Sean Bean decided to kill the moment. <sighs> oh, okay. No, please stay out of this, Siri. Please stay out of it. Um... Ta Tame Sue, Tame Sue says, hello, g'day, Ms. Morden, book chat crew. It was a Sean, a Sean Bean burn only because he, he dies in everything. It took a lot of arrows to die in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, okay, everyone understands that boron is a, is a chemical. Can you name one starting with T? First in wins, smartest person in the chat will get it. T on the period, I couldn't name. Teramide, tungsten, te... Oh. Titanium, that's a good one. I've heard of that. Tech, technicium, that's not real. That's made up. Catch-22, is that made up? What's tessin, te, 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 technicium? Technicium is 100% real. <laughs> yep. Um... <laughs> <laughs> What is it? What is I don't it? remember. It's one of the rare earth elements that, oh, like, God. you don't find very often, and it's got a really high number on the periodic atomic number, so it's almost nothing. Technesium. It's very unstable. Sounds like a DJ. Technesium? Yeah, it does. Technesium. No sandstorm. Technicium. Best karaoke song. I will argue that by performing it one day. Do -do 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 -do. Okay, right now. <laughs> Kidding. Um, what's tungsten? It's very radioactive. Oh. Tungsten is a, a metal. That's what it is. A metal. Does <laughs> it come after the bronze? Tungsten. Tungsten. It's a metal, or oh, the alternative name is Wolfram. That's so much cooler. Wolfram, it's a chemical element with the symbol W and the atomic number 74. Ah, <sighs> yeah, I bounced from science when I was 15. So 16 and on, no periodic tables, just periods. Yay, I didn't win. Uh, KP Dubs is posting the periodic table for all of us. I'll be sure to study it later. 
Not. Hey, book good. Uh, let's get initial weigh-ins. How are we liking it so far? Give me a sentence of what's working. If there's something that's not, feel free to add that in too. We'll go from bottom to top on the list of uh, Discord in the call. Jimmy, book good? What are we thinking? Yeah, I like the book. I, I think it's like a watered-down version of Umbrella Academy. Uh-huh, I see that. Because, you know, they're, they're you know, like kids you know and they think that the world is going to end and you know they have to learn all these skills and learn how to work together and it's just work it's together. very cute it is cute see it's umbrella academy without the tood indeed uh, oddball we like in this one hi clever girl yeah the book's good so far book uh, good. It's, it's different than what i'm used to it's kids trying to figure out where they fit in the world what are you used to? What's your foray again? Uh, I'm more uh, classic sci-fi, like Philip K. Dick and Robert Heinlein type books. His name's Philip K. Dick, and he actually had a career? Most of Tom Cruise's crazy movies are Philip K. Dick. Minority Report, uh, Blade Runner, all those are Philip K. Dick. If anyone wants to know how the patriarchy works, Philip K. Dick had a very successful career, and that's on masculinity. I'm just trying to think of the last good science, like, you know, uh, classic science. We tried uh, for Nerdist, we tried all of the Foundation series. They were dull. How did you find those? Did you read them? I don't think I have. <laughs> so glad that Alvac's in the chat just saying, Film a Kraken. <laughs> Thanks, Alvac. <laughs> Big Beardy Paul drops by and says, G'day, M Dog. Oh, tell me you're Australian without telling me you're Australian. Um, <laughs> chat, we are being naughty. Uh, Big Beardy Paul. Oh, hold on. My friend in radio, Paul? No. Hi, Paul. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Welcome in your first time chatter. Let's make Paul feel welcome, everyone. He's got a big beard. We are using the Discord in the reading section to, um, there you go, we did the bookmark alignment chart, which I am a big fan of. It is a Patreon perk. So if you do want to follow Geek Bomb, ah, oh, we need it. Geek Bomb needs it at the moment. We have managed to hire um, new staff, which is amazing, but it costs a lot of money to run a company and to keep it afloat and to make wonderful content and to do all these amazing things. We offer great perks for just $5. You get not only access to this call where we cover this book for two weeks, but then you also get access to the exclusive after show after Nerdist with Rachel Hine, where we do not record it. It does not get posted. Um, oh, okay. Nice to have you, Big Beauty Paul. You love the Foundation series. All right. KP Dub says, join Patreon. I cannot stress enough how awesome it is. Oh, Michelle says, join us, join us. For less than a gym membership, you can work out your brain with Book Club. That needs to be the slogan. Also, did you see it? <laughs> um, Isaac says, is this a beard challenge? Who has the best beard in the community? Find out now, but be a Patreon backer and you'll be privy to these sorts of things. Uh, I really do appreciate um, all the backers who help keep Geek Bomb alive. We have been around for 10 years now. Well, 10 years, 10 years, and I've got to think of ways to keep it new and fresh and enjoy it and talk about things that I like. And book club is my favorite thing. Play the board, you joined today? Is that you, Manda? Is that you, Manda? Great to have you. I uh, play the board. If that's the case, jump in the Discord call. Say hi. Get in. Get in here. There's under reading. There's a book club channel, and you just click it, and then mute when you're not talking. But I'll get you to talk if you want to. But I've been, you know, I've seen your comments for so long now. I would love to get you in the elite, the elite community. Yeah, get over here. I know, I like that a little bit too much. If you do pop by, make sure you say hi, Amanda. Would love to actually say hi. Say hi proper. Say hi well proper. Um, 
Anyway, I'm so, I have a new computer. I'm new to Discord, so I might join. Oh, I love it. Okay, fantastic. I'd love to have you there. If you need a, if you need any kind of instructions or help, I've got an amazing community. Everyone will be happy to jump in and help you with all of that. Um, will I put you on the spot? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. But I've made some extroverts out of some introverts. So that's a challenge accomplished. Um, we were talking about sci-fi. Sorry, I got so distracted, oddball. Um, we will do some more sci-fi. I read, have you read, oh no, it's fantasy. Damn it. It's called Princess of Amber. Nine Princes of Amber. I liked it. I liked it. Um, M the cartographer. Hello. Hello. You see the card? I did. Yeah. Oh, it's got it a new home next to a little cactus. Um, but good. But good, but good. It reminds me a bit of a mix between Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere and Diana Wynne Jones's series called The Quest of Mancy Chronicles, I think that's what it's called. But they're just Diana Wynne Jones is like writing is so charming and that's what this reminds me of. It's so charming. Um, everything just feels like it's perfectly presented. Yes, it's purposeful. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's quaint, one might say. Um, it's so interesting, though, and I'm I'm going to ask uh, what it re what it reminds everybody of because already Jimmy said Umbrella Academy. That's just a bit sort of watered down a little bit. Um, we're going to hear, I think, very different things. I've got a very very particular one. Um, so, yeah, um, Chris, do you want to chat? With oh, you're already typing. You know, you know. Book good. I'll read out your comment. Um, KP Dubs, book good? Yeah, I really enjoy it so far. But Did you I'm read ahead? A I read ahead? No. Did, okay. Who who read, who read was it that read ahead? It was Jay Bunt Rock, wasn't it? And I Jay Bunt... Get, good. Jay Bunt Rock is not even here to defend himself, so I'm not even 100% sure that it is, but if he can't defend himself, uh, target acquired. Sorry, I, I cut you off. You were saying that this is a good one? Uh, yeah, I, I am a sucker for any, like, sort of, like, mentor or parent-child kind of story, so I'm super into it. Yay! All Easy. the kids are adorable. I love them all. <laughs> I know. Aren't they fantastic? Um, Isaac, book good? Uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying the writing style. It sort of reminds me of a movie uh, with Eva Green, uh, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Uh, which I think it's based on a book as well. Miss Perig uh, Peregrine's Academy, uh, that one? Miss Peregrine? Yeah, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I get that I, I vibe. It, yeah, I think it's based on a, a book or, or novel as well, but I, I'm, I've never read that, just watched the movie. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I struggled yesterday stopping at 10. <laughs> I wanted to keep going. <laughs> We're getting raided, Geek Bomb community. Let's give a huge shout out to the Laser Corn Show. Laser Corn, what have you been up to? I think I can do it here if I go. Okay. If I go. Mm -hmm. I forget how to do anything. Nope. <laughs> how do you shout out? Anyway, Laser Corn, uh, what were you up to? What were you streaming? A big hello to everyone joining us. Oh, KP Dubs is giving everyone a warm welcome by gifting out three different subs here. Dante Bogdan, you got one. Uh, Broken Bow Ranger and Zero Shigaki. Yay! Welcome to the Geek Bump community. Enjoy your new emotes. If you did get gifted a sub by KP Dubs, make sure you say a big thank you in the chat. Uh, Lasercon, really appreciate the raid as always. Do we have like raid anythings? Like, whoa, incoming, the raid. Oh, like we maybe need to do something fun about that instead of me being like, hi, I'm Maud. I host a book club. <laughs> and if you've read this book, stick around because this is what we're talking about. Uh, and the question that we ask you is book good. And we're going through that. Uh, I do have a Patreon and paid backers are able to jump into the Discord to join in on the discussion uh, as we go through it all together. And they get access to the Google Doc that I have written some talking points about. Uh, Chris, I, I did forget and I just want to kind of make a note. I am sorry that I dropped the ball on that one. You did mention you were going to let this book go. And I really want to stress 
if a book ain't it or if you're not in a headspace or if something's just like not gelling for you, no pressure at all. Feel free to call it for the month and have a wash. Um, we cover two books a month, not only for Geek Bomb, but for Nerdist. So never feel bad if the book's not for you. I'm doing a reading challenge. So even if I don't like the book, I'm finishing it at the moment just so I can click that prize at the end of the year. Um, but yeah, brains can be a bit ugh. So you got to listen to what's best for you. Um, Aaron, you're very welcome, Chris. Aaron, game is it? You are think? Do you also agree that Miss Peregrine's home for peculiar ch children? Uh, I didn't have that in mind. I actually posted earlier today about what I felt this was. It actually reminded me of Scooby Doo and the Ghoul right. animated film. <laughs> I, it, I never, never saw it. it. It's basically Scooby Doo and Shaggy and and Scrappy Doo are basically running helping like you know helping out a school full of you know ghoulish Ghouls? children basically all the all the kids that were basically the universal monsters you know uh frankenstein's kid dracula the mummy you know werewolf all that stuff so it's like the can repost the picture in discord just because but yeah it kind of reminds me of that it's like just a bunch of like you know monster misfit kids who are just wanting to be kids but obviously the world doesn't see them as such so that I never saw it, but I like that they were doing that. It just reminded me that they made a new Scooby Doo oh. movie. They like made it and they never, they, they, like Batgirl, it got the. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, is, it, is it interesting yeah. that Jimmy's comments, um, I can say I heard it instead of reading it? <laughs> yeah, I made it a bit tighter. I just have this awkward microphone that I'm like, get out of here. Yeah. Uh, did you like it? Book good though, apart from Scooby Doo. Yeah, book good. I, I did enjoy it. Mm. Did you read it? It was ahead? hard to. It, no, it, I was about to say it's like it's hard like not to because it, it's know. finally starting to like build momentum. It was slow at first, but now it's like it's hitting a stride. It's hitting a stride. I know. I was going to read it for the second time. That's the thing. If I want to keep reading it, I keep reading, but I have to start at the beginning again. Uh, Clever Girl, you were liking this one. Oh, I love this book. I think the kids are all so adorable. Did and you did I, you stop in time? Uh, I did and started a couple of other things. So okay. Okay. I, I could have kept going, but I just uh, decided to try something different to uh, prevent the temptation. You've been reading quite a lot, actually, and you've got such a um, an array of different books. You're not stuck yeah, into a genre. Yeah. Mm. We're yeah, good read friends, so that's how I know this. <laughs> yeah, I've probably got too many going on right now, but um, but they're all interesting. I, I like all the different viewpoints. I I don't know. This is has nothing to do with books. But, uh, and I don't know if this is an appropriate place to share, but um, yeah. one of my grandchildren just came out as trans, and I want to celebrate my new granddaughter. Oh, how exciting. How old is she? 17. Um, what a... And I'm a little worried because she's going back to high school in person in texas texas oh, that's tricky there are some places in america that are just not as progressive and open even though this is not hurting absolutely anyone and it is freeing her oh she's, I really... she's so happy that's what's important what is this i got a notification where's the Who's doing the? Who, oh, is my one second? I'm sorry. This is the worst timing for it all. I'm hearing all these noises and these notifications, but I'm not seeing what it is for. If anyone can help me out with that one, um, but I'm really, really thrilled for 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 her and for her this discovery and to realize that she's finally able to be who she's always wanted to be. It's a Patreon thing. Okay, thanks, Kate Frito. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you. Um, the chat's just absolutely thrilled, though. There is so much support for her <laughs> here, and there is support for a lot of people, um, whether it's online, in communities. Aww. Well, her family is being really supportive, and it makes me really happy because um, uh, my son's father was pretty homophobic, and it's taken a lot for my son to just come around and accept, you know, you're my child, I love you, and mm -hmm. I want you to be happy. Um, her mom took her out to buy makeup and stuff like that, so. Oh, that's wonderful. And I think the most important thing is to sort of educate what this transition does look like, how to do it seamlessly, because it is a very um, not fast-growing community in the sense it's more – it has been a lot more normalized and I have noticed that even lingo um, and what's proper and what's like a certain decorum can actually change even every sort of like t a year or 18 months. So once, even if you think sort of like, oh yeah, I've got it down pat, there's a lot of flexibility and ebb and flow with, with how it all goes. Um, but that's, I think that the best thing for this is just acceptance, love, and support, which is what you have in abundance, Colleen. Oh, you know, that's one of the things I do love about this book is because it just resonates with me that this is a place for children who have no other place. Yeah. And, you know, the really horrible, harsh reality of all of this is, you know, um, transgender people are born a particular gender they're just assigned the wrong sort of body um and i think that when choice like that is removed it's for, and you know same thing for uh being gay um you know sexuality it's it's just something that is above a choice and the suicide rate for transgendered uh youths especially is extremely high because of that really key component of acceptance and a lot of families just cannot and it's the saddest thing to literally deny um, the acceptance of a person truly, truly becoming who they are. Breaks my heart, but there is a lot of support online, um, thank goodness. And there's a lot more acceptance and even um, people trying to bring down that, that the big bigots who try to say otherwise. Um, and I think, yeah, love conquers all. So... Thank you, Colleen. I love that. And you're exactly right. It's a huge theme of this particular book. I'll get more into it um, once I hear from Catch-22 and Avery. Whoa, Anonymous. It just gifted a sub to Polar Bear Cave Jew. What a name. Is, is the polar bear Jewish in a cave? There needs to be more Jewish polar bears. Welcome to our community. I just don't understand the name. I love random names. You get to choose whatever name you want to be, you know? Um, I will forever be a big fan of my turd crew. So, yeah, love this. I love this. Um, hey, Catch-22, your headset's working now. Book good? Um, book meh. Why? Honestly, it's not me. It's not my thing. I'm just... It's kind of a grind to get through it. It got better the last half of the first half, but it's not it's not my bag. So I, I look online and I get a big scope of what people think about the book. I will say that um, out of – where is it? I wrote it down. The reception. I'm probably in a minority. <laughs> It's got a 4.45 average rating with nearly 300,000 reviews. I yep. did see a review. I look for, I try to look for negatives as well so we can get a grasp on the scope. And this woman wrote an article or like a blog post, like I'm stopping this book, but you don't have to. And I was like, I'm interested to read this. And she was just like, Ugh. so then there was a, what is it? I'm trying to remember it. There was a sprite. And I was like, what's a sprite? And it's like an elf or a fairy. Oh, no. And then there was a moving statue. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. I 
hey, this kind of fantasy. I thought it was so funny. I was like, you got mad because like the genre is not really your fit. But I was like, you're going to get mad over a pixie? A sprite? A sprite? Um, what is your jam again? I know that it's crunching um, mathematical numbers. Yeah, well, um, I'm more of a sort of a traditional sci-fi. I read a lot of Star Wars novels, a lot of the legends. Um, I have a large collection of those. I think I've shown that before. Um, so I read a lot of that. I read a lot of just like more traditional, like I, like Andy Weir I really enjoyed. Ooh. Um, well, that's how we got I'm you not, in. That's how yeah, we got you into the book exactly club. Exactly how you got me. You got me hooked with the first half of PHM, and I had yeah. to play catch up. Um, so that's kind of my jam. And then when I'm not reading that, I read really weird things like The Theory of Everything by Stephen Hawking. Okay. Okay. I haven't Just even seen I'm the biopic. Fascinated. Of that. I'm fascinated by theoretical physics. Ah. <laughs> uh, Theoretical physics and I. Mm -mm -mm. One day, Mod, you and I will have a conversation about multiverse theory. <laughs> so, is it true that every time we make a decision, it splits again? Because that's every that's the, person that's, making. That's every... the idea. Multiverse theory, if you follow it to its logical conclusion, is every possible outcome of every possible decision. That's overwhelming. <laughs> no, no, that's that's why it's fascinating because it's literally anything is possible. Did anything. you did you read the book when we did Blake? Not recursion. After Dark Matter, Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. I just have to do oh. hand movements. It was really good. <laughs> it absolutely messed me up. I had a borderline existential crisis for that because it was going into the multiverse. Essentially, this guy is a scientist. He's happily married with a kid. He's going about his day and then he gets kidnapped by another version, universe version of himself that wanted his so, life over the one that he got. Um, so basically the movie The One with Jet Li? Kind of like that, but I haven't seen that one. I know that Jimmy has, but the one uh, he's trying to kill every version of yeah. himself this one it's more of like the science and exploration of he was able to get a scientific breakthrough because he sacrificed love and family and all that kind of stuff and then realized that yes i made interdimensional multiverse travel a thing but i don't like the life that i ended up with um and it just kind of set my mind in if maud comes barging through that door <laughs> is she gonna look at me and be like girl Yes. Are you talking to strangers on the internet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> or is Maud going to be like, oh, sweetie. Oh, <laughs> your dog's your, well, the, the your, dog's your that daughter. Question, <laughs> the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> it's both. Odds are. I didn't like that. <laughs> I am sold. I will read this book. You've sold me. So I will check it out. Okay, great. I like that. I would I would have done it for book our book club, but it's already been covered over a book club. Um, All good. Avery, we're going to move over to you, but then I've noticed we have a new name in here. Tamazoo, who said hi before in the chat, is all of a sudden a wild Tamazoo appears in the Discord. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say a hi to you and get the name pronunciation locked in. But Avery, long time, so lovely to have you back. I am very happy to be back. How you been? Very busy and very tired. <laughs> but, you know. I do know. I do know. <laughs> but to how it's you find... All... Yeah. <laughs> Anything you want to chat about? about? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I am loving this book. Yeah, um, okay. As we have kind of talked about, you know, previously you all kind of know that I tend to like books that are like fun and fluffy and simple um so this is all of those mm -hmm. and i love the found family trope in anything uh, and this one's really big on it and yeah find your people that's literally what this is all about and the older that you get i've discovered the more comfortable you are in being like oh you're not my person you're not my person I don't have to put energy into those things. 
But here are the people that I do like and appreciate and have a lot in common and they fulfill me and they nourish my soul. So I get to concentrate on them, which is why I got a mate date after this with a friend of mine who I think is just fantastic. And I want to make sure that I'm in their life because that's a choice that I get to have if it's reciprocal. So I hear you on that one, Avery. Lovely to have you back. Tamasu, Tamesu, help me. It's, it's, uh, I mean, anything's good. No, I what guess. is it? I tend to, it involves my last name, so I guess Tamzu would probably be the most loyal to that. T Tamzu. <laughs> yeah, it's an inside joke from college a long time ago. Well, now it's our joke. Tamzu, no. how are you? Welcome! Welcome Thank to the Discord! Welcome. Yeah! And, uh, you inspire, oh, I'll go into the story later, but you inspired me to join this um, when I ran into you at San Diego Comic Con. Hey! I was like, I will make people read books. I was yes. a little threatening. <laughs> well, you were not at all threatening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was a great pitch, and I would not have stumbled across this book if it were not for you. So. Did you get to read some of it? I have gotten to read some you of it. You did the homework? Um, I, I, well, I... <laughs> Music teacher mod. Hopefully, I saw it was part one, so I've read enough to feel like I put myself part one. Is okay, that, is that, that is that will <laughs> suffice. <laughs> I'll finish it by the time part two rolls around. That's exactly <laughs> how this goes. Um, Good. So, a little background for us all: where you calling in from? What kind of books? I mean, I'm call I'm calling him from San Francisco. And what's your genre, what genre of books do you usually like? What's your favorite book? Give us your oh, wow. book. So I, well, that's hard on the spot, but I think um, my favorite book is, I mean, I read it for school. Is that okay? For totally a while fine. ago. Totally fine. <laughs> but it's A uh, Hundred Years of Solitude, which I guess is like, you know, prize winning magical realism. But I don't know if that like, the, I read lots. I used to read fan a lot of fantasy when I was younger, maybe a little more nonfiction now. Uh -huh, and kind of uh -huh. in between stuff. I read way too much Twitter. I should probably read. <laughs> and if, I read a lot of like political philosophy when I was in grad school. Oh, school. wow. I actually so. did. I found if I spent all the time just doom scrolling or going th through that motion as I did reading, I could read a lot more. In fact, I want to read a little bit more nonfiction. I've noticed that doing two book clubs a month, I'm very much genre locked in a way, which is why I love that my nerdist co-host Rachel is very much into sort of more mysteries and thrillers because I'm just like, are there fairies? Will they smooch? Um, and so <laughs> it's, it's nice to kind of expand the repertoire. Uh, it's kind of interesting because this book is a modern comedy fantasy is what it's kind of being like a contemporary fantasy co comedy so it's i think it's just wholesome as fuck and that's what mm -hmm. i love that's what i love um and you're saying that book book's good oh i i think um too soon to tell right i haven't finished it so i don't want to judge it you know true there's so far i see some uh potential strengths and maybe some potential things that could be better but i have to, i want to finish it before passing any judgment okay all right so is that <laughs> that is acceptable you never need permission here hi yeah, piling I sorry piling's just joined the chat hi piling hello <laughs> hello <laughs> uh well i'm glad you stopped by i'm glad you're a part of the the book club uh everyone's always welcome as long as you are willing to read and chat about it um Everyone reads too much Twitter. It doesn't matter how much Twitter yeah. you actually read, says Catch-22. Yes, can I, may I, Catch-22? Two, has two zeros, uh, two O's, two O's, two, as it, as it, your grammar. I know that you could tell me the velocity of a moving aircraft. Oh, correct, space, doesn't know the difference. <laughs> but grammar, that's a little something I know about. I gotta catch my wins when they show up. I, I really, I couldn't say Borium, Boron, damn it. <laughs> so I'm gonna correct grammar. Uh, you know what? I think I'm gonna do it so much more when I'm a grandma. Colleen, is it true that if you're a grandma, you become more into grammar? Gram 
I, well, I, I'm like grandma to most of the people I meet now. So, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for indulging my pun. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I actually am not as interested in grammar as I might have once been. Oh, so you just destroyed my theory. Yeah. Okay. Well... Because um, I believe that language is always evolving, so... I was just telling you that about that, and you're using it back against me with grammar. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Colleen, I thought we are on the same team here. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to shout out to some people that have just joined the chat, not only Piling, uh, who is here. Are you... You were in, you're in the group though. Are you going to pop back in, Piling? I swear you're in there. Kakani? It's when you have different names. Hi, T-Bones, coming on in. Uh, Big Beauty Paul says, are audiobooks good? Big Beauty Paul, audiobooks are why I'm reading as much as I do now. I really struggled to read um, when the phone was near me. Uh, and so audiobooks are, you weren't, why do I always get that wrong, Piling? Sorry. Um, it's just some things disconnect, wires crossed. My apologies. Everyone have a lot of grace with me. Um, but I walk every morning, I'm in the car and I go to sleep and I use audiobooks. And I, I listened to, I finished four books this week, in the last week. There are, what, 12, 14 people on this call and I was fishing for it. Fishing. I had the, the rope and the bait and I cast it out. I'll try again. <clears throat> I I finished four books this week. Woo! Thank you, Michelle. I just needed some validation. That's all I needed. That's all Go I needed. On. That's it. <laughs> Michelle, thank you. <laughs> that, was a qu that was a quiet moment for me and you managed to support. Thank you. You understood the assignment. Yes. <laughs> I spelled book wrong? What do you mean I spelled the book wrong? Cerulean, see? Oh, yeah. Oh, I've started a war we're, now. We're in a we're in a Boko chat mod. If you look at this the Twitch stream title, you spelled book wrong. <laughs> no wonder we've got more people watching cuz they're like, what is this Boko chat? <laughs> What is even it? What is even is a boco? Oh, it's a place in Vegas. And in Canada, there's a boco fine art in it's an artist in Vegas. And then there's a place in Canada. They must be restaurants. Um, all right, let me change that. <laughs> but I know I've started something like it's going to be on. From now on, I'm gonna have to triple check everything. I mean, I'm totally Boko down for Boko chat. That seems fun. Boko chat. Boko chat. Boko good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Boko good. Um, a big hello to R eleven three six five five. Thank you for your phone number username. Welcome to Bo Boko chat. Damn it. <laughs> Boko go <laughs> down. Of course, that was KP Dubs. Boko go Oh no, we are just evolving in front of everyone's eyes. Go go Boko go. <laughs> Shit. All right, back on task. Let's talk about this book. We've got it from everyone. We've got new people joining. This is amazing. Boko go and um, let's talk about it. Author TJ Clune. TJ Klune is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling Lam Lambda literary award-winning author of The House in the Cerulean Sea, The Extraordinaries, and more. 33 books. He's written 33 books. Uh, being queer himself, Klune believes it's important now more than ever to have accurate, positive, queer representation in stories. I absolutely want to talk about that. Having genuine, accurate, and most importantly, positive experiences. Um, I think that's fantastic. Uh, he's also done a series called The Tales for 
from Verania. And I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but it looks like something I would be into. And my favorite part, uh, while pr- whilst perusing his page online, was he got a bunch of authors to weigh in. Like, what do book? What do other authors think? And Sean and Maguire, who we just did an amazing Q and A with about two or three weeks ago, talking about our last Nerdist book, Into the Drowning Deep. She was one of the people that spoke about TJ Clune, saying, Sweet, comforting, and kind. This book is very close to perfect. The House in the Cerulean Sea is a work of classic children's literature written for adults and children alike with the perspective and delicacy of the modern day. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Ah, that's a lot of fun. If you missed out on the Q&A with Mira Grant, a.k.a. Sean and Maguire. Uh, Mira Grant is her pseudonym for horror and sci-fi books. Um, you can check that out. It's on Geek Bomb's YouTube. So let's talk a little bit about this book. Linus Baker is a by-the-book caseworker in the department in charge of magical youth. Dykema. Dykema. Diagonally. He's tasked with determining whether six dangerous magical children are likely to bring about the end of the world. Arthur Parnassus is the master of the orphanage. He would do anything to keep the children safe, even if it means the world will burn. And his secrets will come to light. Ooh. Oh, I didn't know that until now. The House in the Cerulean Sea is an enchanting love story masterfully told about the profound experience of discovering an unlikely family in an unexpected place and realizing that family is yours. Oh, dangerously cute. Absolutely. This book was published in 2020. It was on the best-selling list for fantasy. And as mentioned to Catch-22, um nearly 300,000 reviews on Goodreads with an average of 4.45. Even though Catch-22, I mean, no one's opinion is wrong. It's just that you're the only person that thinks it's a mess so far. I'm just, it's not wrong. Not wrong. It's just not your cup of tea. And I feel like in this book, they like a cup of tea. So let's talk about the characters. We have an, okay, Confession. I'm reading this book in a British accent. Um, I asked everyone what the muse was, what it feels like. We had everything from the Umbrella Academy to Miss Peregrine's Peculiar Children Place. (laughs) Um, Bit of Neil Gaiman. Um, The author that I hadn't heard of, but Aaron came in knowing exactly who you were talking about, um, had written some Howl's Moving Castle, is it? People like what they like and that is fine. 100% Colleen. They like what they like. It doesn't hurt anyone. My feelings are a little hurt. I'm joking. I'm, j- I'm joking. I'm just starting a war with Catch-22. Gloves are up. I-, I think it's totally fine. And you know what? You still showed up. You're still here. That's what's, that's what's awesome. Uh, Michelle mentioned Diana Wynne-Jones, Howl's author. There it is. This is gay JK Rowling. If J.K. Rowling was a gay man that had a lot more acceptance than she does, that's what this book feels like to me. And I think that was set into motion when we got Linus Baker's address. Because for some reason, a very British J.K. thing to do when telling a children's tale in that kind of whimsical, quaint fashion is to write their address down. (laughs) Linus Baker of 88 whatever street you're like okay this must have been before google and not wanting to 22b baker street that's sherlock holmes's address who can find it first if you've got a physical copy his address it's got to be in the first couple of pages but i just think it's so funny that it's just the defining feature and also like um the department as well so like you know it's very harry potter-esque to me uh yeah gay jk um one two three fake street well done it does feel very british not only to tell what city and country but specifically what their address was um it's it's sort of that sort of that quaint writing style 
when they have a very proper job, when they sit at a very proper desk, looking around at some not very friendly people. But it's this kind of talk that makes me want to speak in a British accent while talking about the story. 88 Hermes, do go well done. Toaster Poster was in there first, if it is correct. Do we have any fact checking? If anyone's got a physical book, take a photo of it. If we can get an 88 Hermes, Toaster Poster wins the street number and Dugo will win. Sorry, street number and Toaster Poster gets street name. Of 88 Hermes Street. Must have been when he goes to the home. Um, I found the narration and the subtext and the train of thoughts. 86 Hermes Way. Wow, Oddball, Black Belt, and Avery. Uh, oh, Jay Bunt Rock's here. Jay Bunt Rock. I'm going to ask you if book's good, but I'm first going to question you and answer honestly. Did you read ahead? Oh, uh, yeah, I finished the book. <laughs> I do not take back anything I said before you were here. I thought it was you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who read ahead? I know someone did. I say, I think it's Jay Bunt Rock, but he's not here, so he can't defend himself. Um, yeah, I was 30 minutes late. Um, so book good then? <laughs> yeah, I love the book. I don't have any issues with it. It was really fun. and uh, The whole book. The, yeah, and I, I struggle with audio books, but the narrator was so good with the voices. Uh, it did, he didn't lose me. And uh, even I had my kids in the car. I put on a couple of chapters with the kids, and they loved it. <laughs> So that's, I was again doing some research and people going, is this a children's book? And it's like, no, it's for adults, but it is child friendly. So they don't really, th maybe sometimes Lucy says some things that are a little bit gasp. Um, but I think this would be a perfect book to read with the children. I'm so glad you loved it, but no spoilers. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> oh, dear. oh i technically didn't read ahead because i read this in june oh fair okay fair 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 how's that timing you've just read it and then we decided to read it um oh duga duga getting you missed it by one i think you actually duga um You've got the old rickety na homophobic neighbor next door's address. Well done for that one. Toast Post says, we didn't have a book chat last week and I thought we were supposed to finish the book. <laughs> really, Toast Post? <laughs> Toast Post, have you finished it? <laughs> well done. No, I mean, again, and I always will say this. Am I trying to be a bit snarky and ha ha ha? Yeah, always. Always is my default. Am I ever going to get mad that someone's reading books? Never. Absolutely not. That is totally, totally fine. <gasps> Miss Necromance is here. 14 months, thanks for the resub. Are we going to get you in the chat? No, J Bunt Rocks just popped up as well. You're totally fine. It's always good. I'm just, I'm so glad that you're here. Are you going to, are you going to jump on in? Have a cup of tea, meet the missus. What movie? What movie? I quote five movies. Which one was that? Meet the missus. Come on, have a cup of tea. Waiting for someone to get it. How well do you know Maud? Do, 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 do. I could do the whole quote. Ah, she's going to the... She, thank you, Amber and Talia. I knew someone would get it. Lisa's on it. Thanks, love. <laughs> it was the and I was I didn't even do the oh if you'd gone that way you would have gone straight to the castle hello did you say hello no I said hello but that's close enough oh I love it thank you Ember and Aaliyah I'm with my people KP Dubs never seen the labyrinth got you've got pop, pop it on the list pop it on the list even if it's just for David Bowie in tight jodhpurs Definitely. No, no, we don't do, we don't, we don't do what the fucks. If you haven't seen something, we just encourage to explore something, mayhaps. I have a theory. It's not a theory. I have a geek kind of um, umbrella rule. There is so much stuff in the geek sphere. There is so many comics. There are so many books. There are so many movies and shows. Um, and if, if you cannot be expected to have seen all of it. So if, if someone 
Oh, nice. Nice. KP Dub says, WTF is watch the film. It's encouraging. WTF? Watch the film. I like that. That's a lot of fun. That's a great save. And we will apply it in this community. It's never what the fuck. It's always watch the film. I like that. Um, it's like RTFM. Recommend the f fucking movie. <laughs> Did I get that right? Oh, right. Yeah, no, I never read the manual. So that, no wonder I didn't know that. <laughs> the babe with the power. What power? Yeah, the pop culture world is multi-universal. I remember when I hadn't seen an episode. I can't remember what it was. It was either an episode of Doctor Who or it was something. And I got absolutely shat on. It wasn't a nice feeling. Um, but yeah, KP Dubs, absolutely. Sounds good. Uh, oh, I just saw your note in there as well, KP Dubs. I'm on the same page as that. Uh, do we have a Kate in here? Miss Necromancer, are you going to pop on by? We're just asking everyone if the book's good. Oh, headset's not working right now with Discord. Ah, uh, bummer. Um, I'll try and get him to chat if I can. Yeah, let me know if book good. Remind me of the babe. Yeah, there's something about Doctor Who that has a lot of gatekeeping rage behind it. Hmm. Anyway. All right. Sorry. We're talking about I was sharing what I thought it was. It felt like a, oh, you've already read it before. Book good. Okay. Two thumbs up. Um, had my hands full putting away groceries, but I ran to the keyboard for Labyrinth. <laughs> I appreciate your commitment always. Lisa, if you ever want to jump back in the chat and have a, a, a talk and let us know if book good, you're more than welcome. You know that. You're in the community. You're in the Discord. Um, just watched all the new Doctor Who and I loved it. Nice to hear that, J Bunt Rock. Uh, I watched my first Doctor Who in about 2013. I watched my first Doctor Who when I was five. It was Tom Baker and there was a an aggressive vacuum cleaner with a plunger on it and I was out. Um, it scared me. But then I got back in around a little bit later than 2013 though. Um, oh, Black Belt. Who's Black Belt? J Bunt Rock is B Rock Vandal. Uh, I just sometimes get my wires mixed up. Black Belt, are you in the Discord? I see a B. I see a B. I make an assumption. Side note, noting to uh, not, note nothing but love to KP, but he's he is in the hasn't read Harry Potter club with you. Um, I feel like, and I'm not picking fights. Not not picking fights. Uh, Harry Potter is very much a millennial thing, uh, and I feel like even I'm on like maybe perhaps like an old. Oh no, because they came out when I was in high school. Yeah, um, but if I was in high school, then you guys were a little older than that, and that could have been the missing thing because it was notoriously like a kids' book. So you might have just been a little out of the the cusp of that. Um, if you ever read audiobooks, they're really fun audiobooks to listen to. They're great. Uh, and there's a reason why it became a phenomenon. Um, just a shame that JK Rowling is a turf herder, a scruffy looking turf herder. Um, it was a huge social thing. Yeah. I still can't believe it where it's like, so many Americans think that like Gryffindor and Hufflepuff and like the houses thing is just a magical wizarding universe thing. It's not. Australian schools have houses. In high school, I was in Osborne, which was a greenhouse. It's like Slytherin, I guess. And in primary school, I was in Boyd. It was the blue house. Um, you would have swimming carnivals, sports carnivals, and you would compete in your houses. Like your houses, your house was like your school community. No, nah, Osborne, I know, think more Green Goblin, Osborne, <laughs> not Slytherin. <laughs> I was an Aussie Osborne. <laughs> we had a war cry and your war cry is the chant. Uh, you know how like in, in um, British, I really want to talk about this book and I have just segued the entire tangent, tangentially eyes everything. Your audio is still not working. Oh, what a bummer. Um, but I got it out. Uh, Big Beard Paul, where, what were your houses in high, what was your house in high school? The Blue House. What was your house? 
Um, anyway, we would have a war cry and it would go, oh, S-B-U-R, B-U-R-N. Oh, S-B-U-R, B-U-R-N. And that was our war cry. So that's what we would do. But the soccer ones for like the World Cup, they've got some really, really funny chants. I saw one on TikTok, which is just absolutely <laughs> talking about how this whole team is shit. <laughs> what do you think of shit? And then they say the team. And what do you think of the team? They're shit. Thank you. All right. Da, 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 da. It was pretty funny. Um. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cash 22 did a pun. That was good. The Roy Kent chant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good times. T-Bones because in the Red House. All right. So Linus Baker is a sweet, lonely, middle-aged, rule-abiding, and nearly invisible government social worker uh, at work. He's employed by the department in charge of magical use, dichemy. Uh, and he, every time I read Daikami, I think of Daikanoli. <laughs> every time without fail. Daikami. Um, and his job is to visit orphanages that have magical children to evaluate their abilities to care for these children. Linus Baker has had, uh, the only description is mainly he's very, uh, by the rules, black and white, lawful. evil i think people that follow the rules to others detriment is lawful evil um and we ha only have like a little bit of an idea of his looks and that is that he's quite round we over the course of the last couple of days in the reading section which is a patreon perk have been saying what we think linus looks like and we have had such an array of different people it is not consistently one person I will show you something, though, that I think is great. Uh, maybe before I show this gorgeous fan art um, showing every character off in such a beautiful way, please, in the reading chat, show what you think Linus Baker, who you would cast um, in it. <laughs> KP Dubs, I know, I know. Um I think he's lawful good. He follows the rules thinking that doing good, but not thinking if it's right or not. That's not lawful good then. Um, so hello, Philem Roots. Lovely to have you here. Welcome to Book Chat. We're talking about the house in the Cerulean Sea with the member of Geek Bomb's Book Chat community. We're all hanging out in a Discord. It is a Patreon perk, but if you've read the book, stick around, stay a while, have a cup of tea. Um, Trisha Hirschberger and I had a really, really great discussion about alignment like that. And basically like, because good and evil, no one thinks they're evil. Evil people do not think they're evil. Evil people think they're doing good or the, the greater good. And what the difference between good and evil is, and Jimmy, I'm looking at you when you play D&D, good is that it's the betterment for everybody. Evil is that it only serves yourself. So in this particular instance with Linus Baker, he is just doing his job. He signs documents. He shuts down orphanages. And he has absolutely no compassion, consequence, um, or care about what happens after the fact. He is doing his job without any other emotion except what that job entails. Because of that, he's only looking to stay employed and be good at his job. It's not for the actual betterment of all of these people, uh, especially the children, even though he thinks he is. That is why I think he's lawful evil. He's following the rules to a fault with no compassion for the results or what happens. Um, so I, are you basically saying that I am chaotic evil? Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> when you what? play D&D, &D, yes. <laughs> that is exactly what I'm saying. Well, what's life without a little chaos, right? It's, you got to spice it up a little bit. Um, calm, livable. Less bruises. Because, of course, this is just D&D. &D. It's just a game, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I want to make the argument for lawful neutral, though. You did. You said, in my I opinion. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yes, I think he does have compassion, but he has very little power and very limited imagination. So, which which can lead to evil, but I think I think to the extent that he could do good, he, he might. Oh. But he's pretty much a standard functional bureaucrat, which is actually more of a critique of arguably the whole systems. But at the beginning, I mean, my problem with in terms of writing is he's so unsympathetic, at least at the beginning, and I'm sure it changes, I'm guessing, but he's just this very scared, very boring person who has good instincts and, mm -hmm. and probably would do good if he might, but he has no, he's very limited imagination and very little courage, at least at the beginning. Right? 100% courage. That's right. a really good thing. But what, what it sounds like... Oh, sorry, go Oh, I was just saying, my only last point is I don't necessarily think he's completely selfish. He's a little selfish and scared, but he's not like avaricious or, you know. I'm listening so he's to not that. Like evil either. And Manda's saying he's not self serving at all. I think, and maybe this is the difference between a neutral um, or just, just lawful as itself. If upper, extremely upper, upper management changed the rules, he would abide by that. So he's literally putting into motion what's, what he's been asked to do. That is ignorance, right? He's choosing to stay ignorant. Now, this is where it gets blurry because I always say that ignorance is an excuse. Ignorance is literally not knowing. He is choosing to not know. He's choosing to stay ignorant. Evil is knowing knowing better and choosing to not do it. But there is something quite scary and maybe it's lack of courage for someone to willingly not learn or not or to stay ignorant. So when he was challenged by Arthur Panassas being like, so you've shut down orphanages, they're government run facilities. Do you have any idea what's happened to these children? No, I'm not asked to know. He's a cog in the machine. Well done, Big Beardy Paul. That's exactly it. He's got his blinders on. He never takes things a step further than is needed to, which is why he was the absolute perfect candidate to go to Marseilles Island. How does everyone say the island name? Kate's here. Is it working? It is not. No, I know last time we had to mute on and off a couple of times and then it started working. You try that. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to chime in on the Linus discussion. Yeah. Uh, it, my opinion, he kind of sucks. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I think he's supposed I just, to. Like, he, he's just, <laughs> I, that was my question. Like, I, I took notes on this outside of your document. But is he supposed to be really boring and generally unlikable? Yes. Because I was just like, this character sucks. And that's kind of why I keep picturing him as George Costanza. Because oh, he sucks right. too. And that, like, well, I'm not a fan of Seinfeld in general, but I think the George Costanza character really sucks. So it just, like, clicks with me. Like, that's who that is. I like that. Chris is saying that it's Michael Sheen. Uh, I think that's from Good Omens, the show. You've got the gif of George Costanza. Jay Bunt Rock is saying Sam Samuel Tarly from... Um, what's it? He follows... We follow each other on Instagram. That was a flex name drop. Oh, but really lovely. Really lovely. We're just going to say Sam Wiltarly for this one. Um, Oddball is saying uh, he's reminded by Harry Potter's stepfather, uncle, Vernon, in the book. Um, Isaac, oh, a great one. Oh, what's his name? What's his name? Hello, follow. Suku, Sukuba Parola. Is the, is the actor's name. What is it again? Dan Fogler. Dan Fogler. He's wonderful. I actually really like that. But Dan Fogler has so much personality. I could never see him being a boring, empty Linus. Uh, but that's a good one. Michelle, who's this actor? I would cast him as a gnome. I would cast him as um, Talia's father. <laughs> uh, Eddie Marzen. What's he uh, been in? He's very quiet, isn't he? Bruce? 
Sorry, stop this. Like, um, John Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. He's in a lot of BBC stuff. Got it. Got it. Um, hi, Zachary. Uh, Aaron saying, uh, I'm mind blank with names at the moment. What's that? Who's that again? Jim? Nope. Sorry. Uh, James Corbin. <sighs> I've got nothing. I'm looking at it and I just have blank. Blank. Um, Kate, do you want to try talking now? Bugger. No. Are you on your phone or your computer? CT Bones, thanks for stopping on by. Appreciate it. Mm. Computer. All right. Have you got the Discord app on your phone? That's another really easy way to, because it's got your inbuilt mic on that. Um, if I were to direct this, into a movie and I could visualize a lot of it. And so it'd be quite fun to do. And I hope that it won't, maybe one day it does. I would absolutely do the first few chapters in black and white when they're at the office with the stern um, boss going into upper, upper management. Um, there would be very, very little color. And then you get to the island. How does everyone say the island's name? Marseilles? Marseilles? Anyone? Does anyone want to? Marseilles? I think uh, Marcius. Marcius? Oh, okay. I like Marcius. I've been saying Marseilles, like Dr. Sayus, Dr. Sayus, do, 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 do. But it's Marseilles. It's Marseilles. <laughs> okay. It's Marseilles. See you, Duga. Did I? I is Duga with a soft, a hard G? We've gone over this. I need reminding again from time to time. Um, Amadeus, Dr. Sayers. No, it's the, <laughs> it's the Simpsons <laughs> parody. <laughs> Someone said Jim Parsons for Linus. Uh, I think he'd be a better Arthur. I agree. Uh, Jim Parsons is way too skinny to be a Linus. Linus is, he's got a little, he's a lot to love. Linus is, yay, a Simpsons reference. I gotcha. Um, now let's talk about Arthur Parnassus then. He's the master of the house. He's kind, but weary of all things government, especially social workers. He's been described as incredibly tall, so tall that, um, you always see his socks, which has become quite endearing. The way that Linus slowly falls in love with Arthur is the sweetest. Arthur good? Yeah, Arthur good. Arthur Good. I do not relate to Linus Baker at all. And maybe, Chris, that was a struggle that you had. The character was flat and empty, um, work-a-day drone, didn't want more. He had no ambition. I cannot relate to um, Linus Baker. I don't think he's likable. I wouldn't want to have a conversation with him. His dialogue, I was like, you are so cold and rude. Michael Pena as Linus? Michael Pena is so sweet, though. I can't see him being, like, stern and abrupt and cold. And Michael Pena is just a sweet. That's why they're actors, though. You make a great point. You make a great point. <laughs> he will act like that, Maud. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, no, we don't do images in Twitch chat, but let's have a look at this one. Oh, younger Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I pictured, I think I posted it. I pictured um, the guy with the Afro-ish hair from the IT guys. No idea why. That's who I pictured initially. Um, but these are all great suggestions. Let's get some fan casting for Arthur Parnassus. I had Stephen Merchant. Oh, Jay Buntrock says Doug Jones for Arthur. That's good. I had fan art. I wanted everyone to get in their um, fan casts first so they didn't get swayed, but I got it ready to go. Uh, Sito says Richard Aoyde. I'm going to have to look that one up. Richard Aoyde. Yeah, that's his name. That's exactly what it was. Thank you. I didn't know his name. 
And I'm like, who is that? The guy that you just explained. Good. Yeah, there's no reason why he should be Linus. He's a trim, attractive looking dude. But for some reason, my brain just chose him. Yep. Thanks, K. Frito. I kept thinking of a rounder, Harrod Crick. Oh, Will Ferrell in Stranger Than Fiction. I like that. Um, does anyone else want to do any fan casting for Arthur Parnassus? Matt Smith. I like that. Matt, oh, that was, oh, I see your gift now. That's exactly what you're picturing. I like that. That's really good. If you don't want, if you want to know what we're talking about, it's all in the discord section. Join Patreon. Help me run the company. Every cent matters. And none of it goes in my pocket. I really want to stress that. I don't make any of the money from Patreon. That all goes back into the business. Twitch, however. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, alrighty, I'm going to show you the art. Okay. You want to make it a little bit bigger? How freaking cute is this? Um... Arthur's a daddy. Arthur's so gorge. Here's Zoe Chapelwhite, the island sprite. I loved that. I loved that whole part. Um, here's Sal with Theo, little Theodore the Wyvern. Wyvern? Wyvern. I'm always going to do that. She reads books before she learnt the words. Um, we got Lucy, the little terror. We got Talia. And when I was doing my notes, I think it's worth mentioning I was writing out all the kids' names and I forgot Sal and Talia. They're the only two that I had to look up because I'd forgotten. They look like Sims characters. They do a little bit, huh? Uh, here's Fee, the also sprite with bright, bright red hair and fucking Chauncey, my favorite, sweetest, sweetest ever, this translucent slug-like tentacle slippery monster-esque being who just wants to be a bellhop. Uh, I know Talia with the beard. I forgot her name. I thought it was Naomi. <laughs> I thought her na I'm like, Gnome, Naomi, uh, but it was Talia. So I, d I didn't forget her as a character. I just forgot her name. So they were the only two names that didn't stick. K Frito, that is the perfect Chauncey um, emote on here. Let Chauncey bellhop. I know. The fact that he washes all of his clothes and folds them and puts them away. <gasps> Chauncey's the best. Um, and the cartographer is saying, Goo Goo Mbatha Raw for Zoe. Love that casting. She's got that nurturing sort of vibe that I think would be great. And then you've got, yeah, Linus, who just, he wouldn't, he'd be on the, the tube and he wouldn't get up on his seat if you had crutches. Because he sat down first and that's quite proper and that's exactly what he's going to do. Um, pictured Theo as Petrie from The Land Before Time. Sweet. <laughs> no mummy. <laughs> anyway, this is um, fan art. You can find it online. Um, I think that's the Picocha. Um Oh, Kirby Baptiste as Zoe because she's playing deaf. When listening to that, it was voiced by Kat. I can't think of names today. It is not a name day for me. Kat Dennings. Thank you. Thank you. Voiced by Kat Dennings. I love these drive-by facts. I love the unmute boom booms. They're great. Thank you. Uh, Toast Post said the narrator of the audiobook made Chauncey, Chauncey, Chauncey. I thought it was Chauncey as well. Chauncey, Chauncey. Uh, sound like he's from the Island of Misfit Toys and it was perfect. Toaster Poster, I need an example of that. Um, I know how we can do this. J Bunt Rock, you said you listened to the audiobook. Could you give me a demonstration of Chauncey, please? Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Titus, but can I take your luggage? <laughs> I almost want to yoda. <laughs> I think I can hear it. And that is the... Oh, that's wonderful. 
I just think we need more wholesomeness in the world. I think I wrote a tweet yesterday. I can be both wholesome and swear like a sailor. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, I think that this art is so wonderful. Um, so let's talk about the next one. Zoe Chapelwhite, the island sprite who helps look after the children. We stand. We love Zoe. Anyone who's got anyone got thoughts on Zoe, the island sprite? First half of the book. Mentoring. Oh, I had a. Book. I want her to take over the department for underage magical kids. <gasps> Can you hear me? Yes, Kate, we got you. What'd you do? No, oh, come back. Come back, Jack. Come back. The door is big enough. Well, it was like, it was the kind of, K Frito. It was like kind of a burp. You know, like when you just have that thing kind of escape. Oh, it's called a burp. All right. Kate, where'd you go? It worked. I'm yelling. Island sprites take a toll on people, though. They have to be near the island, don't they? Well, they could be a representative. They write letters. Oh, we lost you, Kate. We'll try and get you back. And okay. Can you hear me now? KP Dubs. Yes, got you. Uh, KP Dubs did a pun so good that I missed it. Mm, that's very good. KP Dubs, when you pun so hard that I don't even realize, that's... That's impressive. That was really well done. Uh, Kate, I could hear you, but then you mute again. Have you got like a push to talk thing going maybe? Do you have to push? No, I just didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, hey, how are you? Book good. Good. Yeah, I read it last year. Is it still so... fresh in your mind or did you do a refresher? No, it's still fairly fresh. I think the thing I liked about Zoe is almost that she could see what would happen with Linus in a way. Like, that's the way I kind of, and I can't really say more because I've read the whole book, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it almost felt like she kind of looked at him and she's like, see, saw this black and white man. Because I did say in the Twitch chat before you said that the first part of the movie, black and white, that I saw Linus is in black and white. Yeah. Like in Wizard of Oz, and he didn't turn to color until he went to the orphanage. How did but, you say the island? Uh, What's the spelling of it again? I'm writing it now. I think it's that. Marseilles. Marseilles. Yeah, that's how I said Marseilles. Marseilles. Okay. Marseilles. Yeah, just like she, yeah, she could just kind of Zoe could just kind of see this guy, you know, this kind of non-person, this cardboard cutout of a person coming and seeing life outside of his cubicle. So that's how I like, almost saw her as almost like a prophet or like an oracle in a way. Oh, I like that. I like that. Um, Aaron's giving you a heads up that we ended when they finished their little adventure in the woods and everyone was invited to Zoe's home. That's where we ended it. That's the halfway mark. Um, turns out it's French and it's pronounced Marseille. What? Can you say that? Oh, like Marseille? Like the – no. M A R C. Marseille. Yeah, like that's how you say Marseille, though. Yeah, Marseille. Marseille. Yeah, but that's the spelling of it. Thank you, Avery. Marseille. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay. Um, we are only shown. That's definitely not how it's spelled in the book, though. It's not spelled like the Palace of Marseille. No. Like it's spelled like Marseilles. Marseilles. Yeah. Yeah. Arce Marseille. Hmm. Um, we only are privy to one of the children's files before uh, going to the orphanage, and it is Lucy. Fun fact. Back in 2007, my first car that I bought new, um, not Frankie the Ford Festiva where the front door wouldn't open, um, but I had a car, its number plate was 666, and I called that car Lucy short for Lucifer. So my car and the six-year-old Antichrist, we got that in common. Uh, we find out Lucy is the son of Lucifer, son of the devil, uh, the Antichrist. 
has a wicked sense of humor, is a lot all talk and demonstrates and talks about what he thinks he should be doing. Uh, likes to make fret, uh, threats for fun. Cash22 says, honestly, the most interesting character, in my opinion. Um, what are everyone's thoughts on Lucy, the fact that we're about to meet this child? Because I know that, like, really, really scary children, you've got, like, The Omen, those sorts of movies, um, where they are actually trying to taunt you and destroy you. Lucy's so clearly all talk. <laughs> He's a little menace. He's like a Dennis the Menace, absolutely. Uh, a lot of cannibalism in his thoughts. Listen, Oddball, he's got a very warm place here in this community, if that's the case. Uh, Miss Necromancer says, I really dislike children in real life, but I love the evil child horror trope. <laughs> um, Aaron says, he reminds me of the problem child kid, but loves to be a drama queen. Very overly dramatic. Yes, this is the kind of child I can get behind. Got it. Love it. Um and the cartographer says he's so Max from where the wild things are, but like even more so. Yeah. Rawr. Um, so I think Lucy is a lot of fun, but of course, Linus, if he could clutch his pearls, he would. He's just, he's saying he's not even a religious man, but he wishes he just had a Bible with him. Um, Colleen says, I love how he goes from plague and pestilence to rocking out in the kitchen. This is the thing, and I think this is the whole point of this, where it's like, stop judging a book by its cover. Let's start humanizing every single person. Um, I was listening to one of my favorite nonfiction um, theorizers, no, uh, experts on human emotion. She's a shame expert, um, but Brene Brown talks so much about how how sort of war can happen, how um, genocide, like what you have to do to a human psyche to convince soldiers to kill on sight. And it, the way to do it is to dehumanize these people. So you convince basically that your you convince your army that your enemy are less than human. And when you dehumanize something, then you're able to remove all compassion because you don't see them as a person. You see them as like vermin. You see them as something that is like a threat to humanity, something less than. Um, and a lot of sort of really deep, distressing bullying can lead to dehumanization where you just don't think, you don't feel like you belong, deserve to be alive even like that's how dehumanizing can have an effect. And I think that the purpose of this book is really absolutely to remind, don't judge a book by its cover, but also have compassion with everything that you do and realize that even the son of the devil, the antichrist in a child's body can still have light and shade, can still have really endearing moments um, if you humanize. So now that I've gone off my a shame expert. Yes, Brene Brown has studied shame as an emotion um, and as a feeling. And it's where I've learned a lot of really cool things. Um, oh, here we are reading all the chat. Um, it's a PG Damien Thorne. Oh, yeah, Damien, son of the devil. Um, Toaster Poster says he's got the humor of monsters. I'm loving it. Catch Me Too said, I 100% laughed out loud when Lucy described his enemies. Um, Miss Necromancer says, Lucy is so using his evil genes as a way of pushing people away before they can hurt him first. And it's just so sad and real for a kid stuck in the system, especially when you're a different kid in the system. Oh, yes, brutal. Um, Game Wizard says, that's the one thing I don't like about Linus. He's very overly excitable even Bilbo calmed down rather quickly despite complaining every step of the way true and it's there's inconsistency so he'll take three steps forward and then run a mile back and you're like come on we made some ground uh play the board says I just loved this Lucy said hello Mr Baker you would do well to remember that human souls are cheap trinkets to one such as me I love cheap trinkets yeah it was a great moment Catch 22 says I feel like Lucy knows who he is and even being a, and being a six-year-old is acting how he thinks he's supposed to, even though it isn't really him. 
Um, yes, piling, that's what I was talking about. Um, Lucy is acting how he thinks people thinks he should act. Yes. Uh, Colleen says, I've seen kids labeled in school and then feel like they have to live up to that. Absolutely. When you are labeled, when you are called whatever it is, if you are constantly called um, disruptive in class, hey, the class clown, all right, I got to live up to that. I got to do it. Uh, the flip side of that is when you are told that you are a genius or academic, you the amount of pressure that you have to live up to that as well it can be incredibly destructive. Uh, Big Beardy Paul says, what book book o is this? Which one are you talking about? The one that I was referencing with Brene Brown? Or this one? The books. Boko. Isn't there like a Zelda thing that's a Boko? Deku. Deku tree. But there's a Boko stick. I swear there's a Boko stick. Oh, it's Final Fantasy. <laughs> Oh, no, Choco? Boko the Chocobo? Amazing. Amazing. Um, okay, so Lucy, fun fun character, all bravado, has a very fond uh, taste for 1950s and 60s music from deceased artists. Uh, it's funny because that's a lot of this, the records that my dad introduced me to. Lucy Book. Uh, we got Talia, a 200-something years old gnome, bearded, expert gardener, likes to hit people with a shovel and bury them in the garden, although that rarely happens. The thing about Talia, we meet her, quite interesting, but when you're looking at like after sort of Lucy, which is the son of Antichrist, um, or like the it is the Antichrist, it's like I'm expecting – and I think this is what's supposed to happen. You start expecting that all of these children have a DNA makeup of absolute evil or are incredibly troubled or are killing, maiming, harming because um, of a lot of like foster systems and orphanage. Exactly what um, Kate was saying earlier where it's like when you are given sort of like a really, really hard path, you, you can sort of want to balk the system, not play nice, find a sense of identity become the person that you think you're supposed to behave as, even though it's sometimes not even right. Talia was so innocent. Like, how is Talia a threat? And the only thing that we've gotten from that is Arthur saying, have you ever seen a female gnome before? But who wants to have a chat about Talia? Jay Buntrock, Talia is your favorite. Um, Yeah, I, I, I just loved her from when he first meets her and she's questioning whether she can bury his body or telling him she never killed a human. And then the scene where she's goading him into giving uh, Theo stuff and yeah. uh, telling him if he yeah. doesn't, you know, just the, her overall hijinks, I just loved. Uh, Sprinkles is saying that the garden gnome seems more evil than Lucy. <laughs> I relate to Talia the most. Am I going to threaten you? Yeah, probably. Do I have a beard? Well, I'm trying my darndest. I'm not short, though. I'm also not 243. Uh, Avery has written a quote here going, but I'm 243. Yes, and gnomes don't reach maturity until 500. It was so funny and also accurate for kids who think they're grown-ups. I'm six and three quarters. <laughs> Nearly seven. Uh, and the cartographer says, I thought that the implication is that Talia would be the subject of poaching or something gross like that because of the rarity of female gnomes. Yeah, that's what I got. But I got that with Theo, though, because Theo is like the last of the Wivens because all the Wivens have been killed and draglings, dragons, draglings, dra that needs to, no, that's not a word, um, that they're, they're what's poached uh, or killed off. But you're thinking it's something even worse than that. Kate says, I think it's just that she's rare, period. She's different. Linus's world is the regular world and it's not black and white and dull and ordinary. Anything that's not even close to ordinary is wrong. Beardy, uh, big, big beardy Paul would like everyone to know that he's 32 and a half. And a half. I'm about to be something, something and a half. Something, something indeed. Ooh, ooh, birthday next month. I remember your milestone like it was yesterday, though. 
Toaster Poster says it's normal for kids to push boundaries of new adults, especially if the new adult is an authority figure. Um, yeah, kids are weird. I remember being scared of um, those older than me. Maybe I was taught to respect something wild like that. But I remember meeting like kids that my friend was babysitting and these kids are like, hi, what's your name? Maud, are you a lesbian? You look like a lesbian. And I'm like, how are you weaponizing lesbian and you're 13, 12? I was like, nah, I don't like any of this. Like, bleh. And they're like trying to get one up on me. I was like, whatever. Um, Colleen is drinking from the fountain of youth, everybody. That's all we need to talk about it. Discussion over. And the cartographer says, as John Mulaney says, 13-year-olds are the meanest people in the world, except in this world. They're all so lovely. Um, and that we're expecting them to just be little shits because they are the meanest people in the world. No, no. <laughs> Colleen. Colleen says her kids once tried to scare away the babysitter that they didn't like. Yeah, there's also torment. You, tor you torment torment them um chauncey's the next one the green um, um amorphous blob has eyes on stalks on the top of his head and he wants to be a bellhop when he grows up um the best chauncey is just so sweet just so wonderful they have no idea how he's come about no idea who his parents are or how this has all happened a bit all a bit of a phenomenon um dude just wants to get your luggage and put it into your room it could have been anything but he wants to be a bellhop oh all those moments he's just so excitable so positive just happy to be here and i think the reason why chauncey is such a blessing is because we take so we are conditioned to take so much weight um, on looks, there is a, a, a bias completely with, um, uh, appearance. We all know that that's a severe bias. Um, and Chauncey is not only not like the other kids, like Talia has a beard. She's a gnome. Um, Fee has wings. Chauncey will never be able to look human. Chauncey is a tentacle blob uh, who has no legs and just like really, really is going to struggle and has the most positive outlook. And I think that's like one of my favorite things about this book. <sighs> Chauncey's just living his dream. Kate, I'm not reading that out. <laughs> Kate. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear oh dear uh aaron says i did like the moment when linus is contemplating getting chauncey a little coat to help complete the costume i know that's the thing you just want to encourage this dream because he has this dream and it's keeping him positive um until he ruined it by remembering that he's a desk clerk i know but we got a glimpse of it we got a glimpse of this humanizing of it all um Make sure to tip Chauncey. I know. Oh, um, does anyone want to unmute and talk about Chauncey? A moment that's in the book. Oh my God, that I'll little... go. Yeah, go, Aaron. Uh, it was the first night when Linus was like, you know, sleeping in the bed, and he's like looking underneath the bed because he was worn. Sometimes Chauncey does that because he's told he has to be that scary monster that hides under the bed and he doesn't mm -hmm. see him. And then he wakes up and it's like, you have to realize Chauncey must have sometime either during the night or early in the morning came to his little you know guest house, came up the stairs, got under his bed so he could just tell him, by the way, we're having eggs. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Oh. It's like, oh, you sweetheart, you. <laughs> But the fact that he feels comfort in being the monster under the bed because that's what he's been conditioned to be. Like, oh. Like, he'd be the, like the sweetest monster underneath the bed. He'd be like that, that monster like that would give comfort to kids. That, 
kids would want to have a monster like him on a bed. I know. You like you you're getting into bed, you turn the lights off and then you hear this little noise from under the bed going, "I noticed that your glass of water was empty." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would want that so much. Don't forget to set your alarm. You know? Don't don't forget to set your alarm. You've got a really big morning. Um so just make sure that you set the double alarm because sometimes you like to sleep in. Thanks, Josie. Good night. Oh, so cute. So cute. Uh, I love that. We got Fee. Fee, I I don't think we've tapped into too much about Fee just yet. She's been a little bit cautious and obviously trusts Zoe, who is her mentor, because she's learning all the sprite powers. Um, we did see Fee kind of manipulate uh, elements of the forest and we see her in her element, the forest. Um Fee, she's a young forest sprite. She's distant and standoffish. She's got the power to make plants grow. And I think it's so interesting where we see each each one of these, one at a time, start to win Linus over. Uh, for Fee, it's growing as close as a sunflower as possible. And she's grown it for him because he misses his garden at home. And so they've connected over um, flowers in a way. Those like little things that just make you happy, that you're grateful for. Um, and I think that he's so impressed with her ability that he is really respecting her. For Chauncey, it's the fact that he's, you know, being this bellhop, washing his stuff, helping him out. The fact that he wants to get him a little jacket or a little, was a bow tie, a little hat to complete the look. I already forget. We just mentioned it. Um, uh, Talia, I think they had that beautiful moment where they realized that they were both round and so she decided to hold his hand and he let it happen. And she was like, you can just see her like looking up, holding hands, just like adoringly. Um, and I think that that was really, really sweet. Their friendship bloomed over flowers. Yes, we love that. KP Dub says, we just started to learn about Fee at the end of the reading that we did. She seems more mature and wiser than we may have thought. Uh, Avery says, the balance of staying whimsical while also discussing oppression prejudice and marginalization is truly impressive in this book uh b rock vandal says chauncey fan art on the screen looks like he's from the monsters inc universe maybe he as a baby crawled through the door and then just got stuck oh, oh. so cute hello himura yo hi welcome to book chat we're talking about this book and this is the fan art from it it's really cute. We like it a lot. Um, next, we got Sal. Sal is an extremely shy teenage boy. He turns into a Pomeranian when scared, when scared or startled. But the reason why we find out that he's a threat in a way is because his bite is contagious. Um, and whoever, whomever he bites also will get shape-shifting abilities. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I'm like, go, let's, let's do this. Why not? He's a wear pom, <laughs> but like a Pomeranian out of all the animals. Yeah, it totally sounds cool to me. Hey, STS, how you going? Glad you're here. Wear pom. <laughs> Colleen says, I think there's a breakthrough when he realized how the children were being treated and clapped back with that note to the townspeople. Absolutely. He's like, they're not doing anything wrong. They're keeping to themselves and you are still threatened by them. Cut your shit. And um, yeah, and I kind of love that he's defending them now. And it's like, can you defend something and also tear it down? Uh, Kate says Sal is the most heartbreaking one to me. We find out Sal has gone between about 18 different orphanages over his time and he's still a teenager. Uh, Kate, why, why is Sal heartbreaking for you? Because he's the realest one, like, you know, a big black teenage boy having to go through house after house after house after house. And it's just his weird form being a Pomeranian is just an indication of what he's like as a person where it's just like a small fluffy like thing that doesn't really match his outside because he's like this big muscular teenage boy. Mm. But like, it's also just so because like you see it all the time where it's like a 13 year old black kid is like almost treated like an adult you know what i mean and their so it's child just, is an adult often yeah and it's just too real yeah and i love that like metaphor this. where it's like he looks big you know over overwhelming but he's so shy and when he does transform it's like yeah it's the literal like personification 
Adam McCain of what he is in the inside. And he wrote this poem. Uh, Tosa says, Sal was my favorite. His poem was incredible. Um, KP Dub says the poem was so good. KP Dub, do you want to talk about the poem? He posted a Pomeranian. Aww. No, I don't. No, thank you. <laughs> Aaron saying that the response was the most British thing as well. Uh, the note is left saying leave and he responds with a no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> very British. Um, the poem was a very um, gorgeous sort of description of uh, being treated at face value. Um, it was using a piece of paper and the purpose of the piece of paper where you write on it, but the word gets rubbed out and it's only, you don't see the paper. It's uh, used as just something to write on. Yeah, it was an incredible analogy um, that was super poignant. And, you know, knowing that Sal is so, so shy, doesn't want to participate, wants to try and be as small as possible. But then when encouraged can come up and you're like, man, he's brilliant. He's got such a beautiful imagination. No, so is mine, KP Dubs. I can't tell you for the life of me anyone's name today. I see a picture and I go, oh, cool. That's the name. Um, and the cartographer says, Sal's also the brave one. Yes, he's the oldest, but he's the one who insists that they need to have courage in the forest. He's always doing things that reveal more about his character. Why do we think he's moved 18 times though? Do we, do we know more about that? Or is it just because the bite's contagious and as the Pomeranian, people want to just pick him up, handle him? Thank you, Kyle. Great to see you. I think there was a biting incident. And then they obviously found out that um, that person then became a wear. W-E-R-E. -E. Mm. Uh, lastly, it's Theodore. Theo, the Wyvern, who speaks in chirps, has a secret hoard of treasure and buttons now under the couch. KP Dubs says we would be best friends. Do you want to talk about Theo, KP Dubs? Why you love Theo? You can still say no. <laughs> no, I don't think I will. Theo. <laughs> no. Fair. Uh, Aaron says I love Theo and his joy at getting a brass button was so adorable. So this one I understand a little bit more because it's like um, this is poaching, you know, rare animals that have been killed off um, that their species have been threatened as a whole. I think it's so cool that Theo, because you're like, oh, how's this going to work? It's like, it's like w when do we go from sort of being a person to an animal Um and Theo shows so much personality. And when like you hear these little chirping sounds and Arthur responds this, to the sentence, I was like, oh, there we go. That's really, really cool. Um, but Theo's a lot smaller, hence being able to hide under the couch. Um, and then instinctually, because he's a wyvern, needs his treasure hoard. Um, and treasure to him, this is a thing. One man's um, trash is another wyvern's treasure. And this brass little button that he had in his pocket, thinking he's going to keep paying everyone um, and how much it meant to Theo. And he just lit up and his day was made. And this is a thing where Linus is realizing such a small gesture that didn't really cost him anything has just created so much joy. And so now he's like trying to find ways that he can continue just like making Theo's day. Theo was so appreciative as well, like really kind of responded in such a positive way to it all. He's cutting buttons off his shirt now. Yeah, it's the little things. But I think what's so beautiful about this book is that these children are showing so much joy when the world has tried to remove it from them in so many ways. And that's what's really, really beautiful. Uh, I have talking points. We got seven minutes. Well done, Maud. Uh, quick yes or no in the comments. The setup, is it too much of a slow burn? Isaac, you had thoughts on this. I thought the, the first few chapters where they were setting up uh, Linus were, I don't know, sort of boring, at least in the audiobook. 
He's boring. Uh, it, He's boring. Yeah, it, it took it took me a couple of tries of uh, hearing the first couple of chapters before actually getting into it. Uh, but once he got into the island, I think chapter three or four or something like that, uh, and all of the other characters started coming in, uh, it got a little bit more uh, dynamic. Yeah, because I think like having that really rigid structure in the workplace of going to see extremely upper, upper management, you're just like, what is going on? I loved it. But again, it had that really whimsical, magical feel of like a magical world of Harry Potter where it's like that language. It was very reminiscent of it for me. So I was just in, I was just reading it in a very British accent, just absolutely absorbing it. Even like with those small moments where it's like, um, uh, you don't look worried. He was, you know, all those sorts of moments, which I just love. That was not the quote. I'm not capable of quoting right now. B Rock Randall says, I like the parts with the manager and her assistant, even if it's really cliche. Sometimes cliche does a great job because it can put you in this moment without having to spell it out for you or without having to provide more detail. When you lean to a cliche, you can wrap your head around it so fast. Um, Colleen says it was slow, but there was some very subtle humor. That kind of humor is my jam. Uh, there was not enough cannibalism for Isaac, though, says Kay Frito. Mm. <laughs> uh, Isaac, the clip from Project Hail Mary about um, me burgers came back up. So the conversation about you being very, very interested in what a you burger would taste like. <laughs> yeah. This is the thing about the show. It's broadcast. It's broadcast. <laughs> Kay says, I feel like the slowness worked because the first part of the book is about the drudgery of Linus's office life. I agree with you completely. Uh, Michelle says, I don't mind the slow burn, although I was getting flashbacks of corporate office life. <sighs> we don't need that again. Jimmy says, another great quote. I'm afraid I don't have magic. You do, Mr. Baker. Arthur told me that there could be magic in the ordinary. Aww. Uh, Colleen says just referring to extremely upper management was some tongue in cheek humor. Yeah, I know. I, I get it. They're just absolutely doing two middle fingers to corporate life. Um, okay. Sweet. It was slower for some than others. Um, I, I already asked this one question when we did the book good, uh, style of writing, who does it remind you of? And I'm like, gay JK, um, picturing the characters. We had so many different casts in our mind. Yep. We got that through in the discord. Um, I loved, this is Catch-22. Catch-22, do you want to go through your talking points? Do you have the doc in front of you? Or do you want me to read it out? Um, I can. I mean, I know what they are because I. it was just one of those things that struck me because it doesn't happen a lot in sci-fi that I read. Yeah. Uh, is the inclusion of real-world events in this sort of fantasy realm where, you know, Linus meets, goes into Lucy's room and he sees the records and it's Buddy Holly and Richie Valens and the Big Bopper and all of his artists that died, especially the ones that died in the quote unquote day the music died, mm -hmm. which is like that actually happened. You can look it up. It's a real thing. Yeah. Um, it was just kind of like that was unexpected. And it made to me, it made Lucy much more humanized because like for the whole time you're like, it's just this kid that's the son of the devil and then all of a sudden you find out lucy really likes music yeah and i'm like totally i love music <laughs> so it just humanized lucy for me a little bit which mm -hmm. is you know part of the reason why i like that character yeah um anyway you... it was just interesting to me that it was an inclusion of real world events in a fantasy realm yes yeah so it's normalizing it's like it's our universe but yeah dot mm -hmm. dot dot um, does he also have a past in corporate office culture or federal government work? He paints a very bleak image of it coming from someone that works in a cubicle. It's not all that accurate at all. Interesting. Um, I did a little research. There's some controversy, controversy, as some say, around what this was inspired by. Um, and it was called the 60s scoop. Uh, Cash 22. Oh yeah. You looked at it. It's exactly right. Cash 22. It's all a lot of, I think about, but I mean, am I saying that cause I'm in a place of privilege? I don't know. But 
Uh, basically, in Canada, beginning in the 1950s and continuing through the 1980s, Indigenous children were taken from their homes and families and placed into government-sanctioned facilities, such as residential schools. The goal was for primarily white and middle-class families of, uh, across Canada, the US, and even Europe to adopt these children. So basically, if you take um, Indigenous children, you can raise them as white and stamp out all of their culture and... Um, and raise them as if they were white in a white culture. It is estimated that over 20,000 Indigenous children were taken, and it wasn't until 2017 that the families of those affected actually reached a financial settlement with the Canadian government, totaling over $800 million. So what the influence is, is taking children that are different and raising them um, in a government facility. So that's kind of where the inspiration came from. Um, and some people were quite offended by that being sort of the the inspiration of this book. Um, but there was a follow-up that I was reading in this research. Um, so some people were um, – even the description of residential schools is sugarcoating it. He bedazzled and turned into fantasy, the trauma of children who were forcibly separated from their families in a cultural genocide um, and then acted like it was all figured out after a settlement, literally profiting, profiting sorry, off of missing and undocumented children and people who were still living with the trauma of residential schools who are still living like second-class citizens in their country due to the impact of those schools. So basically it was like, hey, don't sugarcoat this, don't like – fantasize like not uh, fan fantasy esque scope on it um but then there was a follow-up did he actually was say he was inspired by that or was that just it did, was did, was that actually one of his influences or was it just because you know you could look at it and just be like it's just a foster child program right you know yeah i'm hearing you on that i have the speaking also as a canadian who's familiar with that oh, <laughs> and interesting. Worked with one of the judges that worked on that so um, I did only a little bit of research. Um, I don't uh, – okay, it's not on the site. Um, I think it was referenced that he wanted to sort of focus on how the government was interjecting on ch some uh, children in schooling, like forced to be in government schooling. Um, but then a follow-up said, one common thread that I see is that many who are angry at Mr. Clune did not even realise that he was drawing inspiration from the 60s fib initially, with some even saying um, that they adored the book before they learned about that unseen aspect of it. I didn't see any allusions in the text either and read it as an allegory for discrimination against queer people. Suppose you wrote a story that is more openly inspired by the 60s scoop featuring actual Indigenous children as, as opposed to magical beings, then I would find that more objectionable, profiteering and ghoulish. As far as I can tell, Mr. Clune is not fronting a specific story about first first nation people and neither is it marketed that way at all he isn't taking up space he's not trying to overshadow the voice of indigenous writers he wrote a general story about discrimination and kindness using magical children as his allegory stand in for marginalized people a concept that he conceived of even before he stumbled onto the history residential schools uh it isn't a particularly original idea i mean it's kind of x-men um and he didn't talk about his inspirations no um no one could even tell Oh, if he didn't talk about his inspirations. So he did actually say that it was influenced by it. Um, the only, they only knew because he informed them, and I dare say some of his haters only learned about the 60s scoop and residential schools because he chose to use his platform to talk about it. So that's – I kind of wanted to talk about um, the history and influence, I guess, of this book. I also want to say this is not just exclusive to Canada. Um, I wonder if Canada took inspiration from Australia – Australia did it in the 30s, the 1920s to 40s, but definitely in the 1930s, post-depression. They literally, it's called the stolen generation. Because of the government, same precedent, same mentality, let's take children and raise them white. Um, and they would steal children from their families, steal, forcibly remove them in a government program um, and raise them with white families. And it's something that, uh, the Indigenous community, I don't think, was able to reach a financial settlement. In fact, all they wanted was an apology. And our government refused to do that, refused to even apologise for the actions of what occurred um, 
1930s, not super long ago, 1950s to 1980s. Oh, US did it in the 1880s. Oh, no, it says here the 1950s and 1980s. Maybe they got it wrong and it was 1850s and 1880s. Oddball, you would know you're smart. Um, and that would make more sense that Australia copied because Australia is a newer country. I went to school with, um, uh, to college with um, a lot of Indigenous people. And um, uh, a couple of my friends joined the American Indian movement. And part of it was um, this, this isn't the um, residential schools or anything, but the way um, indigenous people are still being treated. Uh, one of my friends had never heard English until he went to school at eight years old. He'd never seen a drinking fountain because um, on the Navajo reservation, uh, they have to bring their water in in barrels and things. Mm. Um, most people don't have electricity or running water. And the government has polluted a lot of the water uh, by uranium mining. Um, but my friend, uh, I, because it was so hot, the teacher would line everybody up and take them out for a water break. Um, so he'd never seen a drinking fountain before. So when it was his turn to get to the drinking fountain, he just stared at it. Mm. So the teacher turned the water on and shoved his head in it. Oh, my gosh. Um, just getting some feedback in the chat. Just wanted to provide a trigger warning. This can be triggering for people, uh, especially if you know someone or have um, – a family history of this actually happening. It is a very, very dark side of history, um, but it is one that I think America has preferred to ignore. Uh, and even though it is a hard discussion to have, I think it is super important to recognize just how shitty the past was so that we can not do anything close like that ever again and recognize the hurt that generations of people have faced. Um, oh, it's happening right now in China. Far out, yeah. yeah, you'd hope that this wasn't going to keep happening. Oh, not fun. Um, also, Big Beardy Paul um, is correcting me. I was talking about in 2000 um, when it was John Howard, the Prime Minister wouldn't apologise. Kevin Rudd did. Kevin Rudd said sorry. But just a reminder that the person who said sorry on a global scale, my uncle, performed at the Sydney Olympics closing ceremony and it was very full of contention in 2000 because the Prime Minister refused to apologise and so they wore shirts, the band wore shirts that said sorry on it as a way to demonstrate it's not fucking hard to say and that we are truly sorry. Like white people of Australia shows re showed remorse and were sorry. GG, Uncle G, exactly. Um, we really do need to respect the past we need to respect, not respect the past, but respect that the past existed, that it happened and that the pain was real and that the trauma is real. Um, and God, we got to just not follow that again. Uh, but I think that that was an important discussion to have with this book because that was stated as um, an influence and that is why. Um, but yeah, Catch-22, I hear you on that. Um, we did only have one more uh, thing here and I want to make sure that who said M equals E equals MC squared? That was you, KP Dubs. <laughs> um, who wrote in? Isaac, you wrote in pink. Linus brings up the idea of not isolating the kids so much from the people. Has me thinking of Frozen. Isolating people just for being different or potentially dangerous would make them more dangerous. Would it be better to give them all the interaction from the beginning or keep them isolated for a certain amount of time before letting them go around town or present them to society. I think you're exactly right where it's like, you are different, you are dangerous, we must lock you away. Where what I think Arthur is saying is we need to prepare them and normalize sort of like the harsh, harsh truths of the world, but also have them assimilate in a way where they can mentally prepare for being different. Um, I just think it's so awful as children, subconsciously, we are not taught this behavior, but as children, we recognize different and we outcast it. 
We bully it. We reprimand it. We are disgusted by it as children. And I think that is this appearance bias where Disney princesses were absolutely beautiful. Anyone who looked normal, two arms, two limbs, you know, two legs, two eyes, no um, disabilities, like anything that didn't fit sort of what a default comfort was as children were ridiculed. And I think that this book is really harnessing the most important thing. And being different is so fine. And we need to accept that more. And that's why this island where they are bullying and trying to, you know, get them to move on, even though they're not even interacting, that's sort of humanity, isn't it? That's us at school. And I think it's a really hard thing to learn when we as children are, I've got a mate date I'm late for again. I've got to go. Yeah. I gotta go. Yes, who's chatting? Who is that? Someone said something. Do we want to raid anyone? Great chat, though. Great book discussion. I could keep talking. I have a mate date, and I've already. I'm sorry, been I left my. I was on mute. My cat was meowing at me. So that I'm was sorry. your cat. <laughs> my cat was meowing, and I didn't realize I hadn't muted. So I thought someone went um. <laughs> like ready to talk okay everybody we'll, well pick this up next week it's my roommate's us. lonely cat sorry <laughs> see you soon meow meow see everyone next week meow. same time five o'clock uh let's finish the book that's the homework hi adam vision are you about to stream do you need me to raid into you who should we raid let's look at quick who what do we feel like what do we feel like apex legends i'm getting everyone into apex i was going to play tomorrow but i don't think i am anymore i think i'm moving it to sunday finish the book finish the book all right let's raid if because it's apex legends and he is an apex legend also go say hi to iffy if you don't know who iffy is if he's and i have had amazing conversations about really tough things about racism in america um, me trying to learn as much as I could about it because it's very different in Australia. If he's a great host, he's a writer, he's good value. So go by, say hi. See you everyone next week. Bye.